What? Terry Denner of the MathWorks. So this is our second video in the series on refrigeration cycles, uh, but we're looking at in this one a um, traditional CFD method, and uh, basically one that has nothing to do with refrigeration cycles. But the idea of CFD, uh, of course, is important on what we're going to be doing in this overall series. Okay. Now this is uh, kind of a fun one for me because it really kind of draws upon. Well, it gives me the opportunity to talk a little bit about things I did in my past. And so I finished my PhD at Stanford University in 1995, uh, worked for a wonderful professor, uh, my PhD advisor named Don Baganoff, and our team um, was developing simulations for things like, you know, re-entry of the space shuttle. You know, so these extremely high speed, um, high Mach number, probably like Mach 35, um, re-entries that occurred as well at extremely low air pressures. And that presented all kinds of interesting things that we need to figure out. Now this demo, uh, what we're really looking at, and you can kind of see, hopefully it comes across in this last image, it's channel flow. It's a converging, diverging channel, and that's kind of the key to going supersonic. And so we transition from very low speed flow, ultimately up to, looks like uh, Mach 2.5. Right. Now, the other things we're observing here is pressure, temperature, and velocity. Right. And so, of course, you know, thermodynamics and fluid dynamics, they always kind of go well together. All right. So, anyways, when I was at Stanford, um, I had a wonderful teacher for CFD. Uh, his name is Robert McCormick. Uh, he's retired, and, you know, knowing him, he's probably really enjoying retirement, too. Um, but it just, he, he was excellent at fluid dynamics and computational fluid dynamics, but it was a, a, a wonderful lecture and a lot of fun to, uh, to, to, to get to take his class and get to know him. So anyways, uh, he came out with a book, which was really kind of a summary of, of his notes that he used at the time. And I bought that about, oh, probably about four or five years ago. And it's a really good book. And I'm using it a little bit in the model that I'm showing right now. Right. And so. I want to basically just kind of introduce the, the general idea of what we do with computational fluid dynamics is, in our case, we're doing this simple channel. This is an image straight from uh, Bob McCormick's book, and it's these, this idea of finite volumes, all right? And so that we just take the entire space and we break it up into to smaller pieces, and we call these smaller pieces, you know, our finite volumes. And the general assumption of um, computational fluid dynamics is that pressure and temperature and velocity do not vary by much within the, the, the boundaries of, of the volume, okay? And what's really important actually is the interface between two volumes. You know, if pressure, temperature, and velocity are kind of constant in that volume, it means we have a means of, uh, you know, understanding state, pressure, temperature, things like that. But also from kind of the rules, which I guess you would say kind of go to back to, well, certainly everything in mechanics, in my opinion, traces to Newton, but the, the expression of the mechanics of fluid, probably like Euler and certainly Navier-Stokes and all those people, right? But the, the basic idea is that knowing the, the state and quite often a convenient expression for state will be density, specific momentum, and specific energy. Now, these translate through the, the rules right here, if you make an assumption of an ideal gas and do to pressure and temperature and velocity. But, but anyways, if we know these things, we can figure out the flux of mass, momentum, and energy across those boundaries, and that uh, we can pretty much set up those control volumes uh, for each of these. So I'm not gonna dive too much deeper into it than that. Um, and certainly I will, if, if you're interested in the topic, I highly endorse this book. It's a really good book, and certainly an expert on this uh, is, is Bob McCormick. All right, so anyways, let's kind of get into what we have here, all right? And so you'll see that I got this all started by running a script I call Test Objects, so let's just open that up. 
and there it is. And um, it's object oriented, which was kind of cool. And in general, I think MATLAB's in an incredibly good environment for doing um, uh, CFD, and certainly these these uh, objects work pretty well. Um, with regard to what we're looking at here, I think um, I wanted to find where's my update here. Set initial conditions, time step, number of cells. Okay. And then run the simulation right here, I guess. Okay. And you'll see that what's being returned by the running the simulation will be, you know, for all the volumes we're using, which you can see up here, it's only 20 because we're doing a one dimensional, you know, it's really quasi one dimensional flow. Uh, but let's open up the running here. And uh, here's where I'll make my case for MATLAB in general as being a real good tool for this is uh, the calculation of the implicit state increment. Okay. And really, all I want to say is implicit state increment is a, well, it's, it's a array with 20 components because there are 20 volumes being used here. And, but it's also a little more complex than that. And it's a, a, a measurement of the update on mass, momentum, and energy, really specific mass, momentum, and energy in each of those, those volumes. And, the the word implicit is really important because we're solving for all of them at the same time and that occurs because you can essentially define the appropriate matrices and that's what implicit matrices are and certainly there's a lot of math that was captured in this and that there's an array called explicit state increment and i'll, I'll simply say that that simultaneous calculation for all variables it is um, a wonderful thing with regard to the numerical stability of, of such a calculation. Um, and it's certainly really, uh, a key thing in, in tools like Simscape as well. All right. And now just kind of make a little bit of a case for object oriented. You know, there's an inheritance of fluid properties and defining a finite volume class. But generally, here are properties that we keep track of. How big is the volume? What's the length? What's the surface area? What's the initial pressures, temperatures, things like that? And that there will be methods that are super important, too. And um, this is where kind of like all those implicit matrices were calculated based on things that are taking place here. Um, I kind of like because I think it's a reasonably easy thing to look at, uh, is the method which calculates pressure, temperature, and fluid velocity from the state. So again, our state is to be defined in terms of, yeah, I probably didn't do a good thing calling it state one, state two, state three, but think of that as mass density, momentum density, and energy density, right? And uh, ultimately there is an a implicit uh, well, I'm going to use that word in a, you know, the more conventional context, implicit presumption that this is an ideal gas. And as we get into, um, that's probably all I really need to show. But, uh, the, but the idea of volumes and state and different ex expressions of state, as well as the idea of fluxes and surfaces that kind of pass things. You know, the, these are the, the key principles of fluid dynamics. And, as we move into the refrigeration cycle, underpinning all of it is generally the same kind of thing. You know, there's really a traceability to formal methods for computational fluid dynamics. And I'll just state that delivering it, well, doing it for two phase, you know, vapor liquid equilibrium system, like we have for refrigeration, I'll just say it makes it way, way harder than relying on the ideal gas law expression. Not saying that we're bringing it to Mach 35 like I did at Stanford 25 years ago, but but uh, this application has its own complexity, and so this will kind of bring me back to kind of like one more comment of a great I'll call mentor for my past. And uh, when I first joined MathWorks, uh, you know, coming up on 19 years ago, um, me and uh, the person who really initiated the creation of our fluid terms uh, tool. Uh, a guy named Val Chakumar. Val was a professor in in uh, so in in the uh, uh, in Russia, in the Soviet uh, the, the Soviet Union uh, in the 1980s. Full professor, and as that 
country really kind of dissolved and everything. Uh, you know, he kind of mo moved on to do various things. But uh, one of his initial jobs was developing the hydraulic package for Sabre. And then he came to MathWorks and really led our efforts to do fluids initially on hydraulics as well. And, uh, and, and I'll just say this, okay, the, the, at the time I knew nothing about hydraulics. And, and so I told Val, I go, well, Val, you know, I did a PhD on computational fluid dynamics and did like, you know, hypersonic stuff. I think I'll be able to, you know, really, you know, really learn how to use the, these, do these hydraulics blocks real well. And, and uh, I think I'll, I'll be able to learn kind of the, this, the stuff about hydraulics pretty effectively. And, and Val made this great comment and he goes, well, Terry, you know, knowing fluid dynamics, you know, and thinking you can do hydraulics, it's sort of like knowing mathematics and thinking you can do accounting. Okay, and that there's certainly some truth to that. And certainly as I've moved into kind of this recent study on, on refrigeration cycles, I realized, wow, there's a lot of really crafty, really clever ideas went into figuring out how to do this in the real world. And, and certainly at MathWorks, we have some wonderful internal resources. I'll probably talk a little bit more about it in, in some of the later videos. So anyways, um, with that being said, we'll kind of move a little bit more formally into to the refrigeration cycle. Thank you.